In this lesson, we're going to talk about chemical equilibrium, and I'm going to abbreviate that capital EQ. And in a chemical reaction, oftentimes we'll write a reaction with an arrow proceeding to the right only, but many reactions also run in reverse. And so if we do have a reversible reaction, then at some point that reaction will reach equilibrium. So we will look at an example of that and then define exactly when uh, equilibrium has been reached. So this is the Haber process, a famous reaction for producing ammonia. So three moles of hydrogen, one mole of nitrogen react to make two moles of ammonia. And we might recognize this as a combination reaction. We could also start with ammonia and when the ammonia molecules undergo a collision, those bonds will break and that could decompose to make hydrogen and nitrogen. Generally, a decomposition reaction occurs uh, if we heat up a reaction, but if these are all gases in the same container, then there would be nothing preventing any of the, those from colliding with each other. So these two reactions are opposite of each other. Uh, and instead of writing both reactions, we generally write an equilibrium reaction with two arrows. That's not the same as a double-headed arrow. A double-headed arrow is reserved for a resonance structure. So we don't care about that here. And if we started out the reaction with only uh, hydrogen and nitrogen, the initial rate would be the fastest because that's the point where we have the maximum amount of reactants. And as these reactants undergo collisions and their bonds break and they form to make products, there will be less of these reactants. So the rate, the forward rate will start out fast and begin to slow down. As the concentration or pressure of ammonia increases, then there's more ammonia molecules that could undergo a collision and um, break apart to make hydrogen and nitrogen. So initially, the reverse reaction is slow, and then it speeds up. So as the forward reaction starts out fast and slows down, the reverse reaction starts out slow and then speeds up. There comes a point where both of those rates are equal to each other. So there's no net change in concentrations, even though this reaction is constantly making NH3, and NH3 is constantly making H2 and N2. The overall change has uh, ceased. So no matter what we do, nature will always reach equilibrium, or a reaction will always reach equilibrium. And in chemistry, that is a problem because we don't want to stop making a product. So when we make a product, then we make money. So chemists are interested in altering, well, first of all, understanding equilibrium and then perhaps doing some things to change that. So we come up with an expression, and we write it as a capital K, which means a constant. And what we do is we write, we make a ratio of all the products divided by all the reactants. So in our, I'm going to rewrite this reaction here, we have three moles of hydrogen and one mole of nitrogen, and we made two moles of NH3. These are all gases. So we have a homogeneous mixture and an equilibrium expression since we have two moles of ammonia, we're going to have a two right here because that's really two products. And so the product, the mathematical product of both of those chemical products uh, means that instead of writing NH3 times NH3, we can just write NH3 squared. And the same thing for the reactants. There are three products of hydrogen, so instead of writing hydrogen times itself three times, we just write hydrogen cubed. 
coming as only one nitrogen. So the equilibrium expression has the product of all the formulas. And we could write this in terms of concentration units, mole per liter, or pressure units, meaning atmospheres or pore. So the most important thing is the equilibrium constant is always products in the numerator and reactants in the denominator. The constant is unitless, and it does vary with temperature, so we'll talk about that later. So being able to take any reaction and write an expression for equilibrium is going to be important because of the math that we'll be doing. Okay, so the next page, the value of K can tell us something about the reaction. And since products are on the right, reactants are on the left, and products are in the numerator, and reactants in the denominator, then a large value for K simply means we have a large numerator. So a large value for K means we have a lot of products. And again, for chemists, that's good because that means we're going to make money. If K is really small, that means we have a small numerator or a large denominator. So that means uh, this a small value for K means this reaction actually prefers to run in the reverse direction. And that's bad if we're trying to make products. So there's a very large range for K values. For example, we could have K equal 10 to the minus 30th. That pretty much means that reaction is never going to go toward products. So if we could look up a K value for a reaction that we were interested in, we would see that and say there's no way that we're going to ever make products from that. In fact, that means that reaction wants to run in reverse. If K is a gigantic number, that pretty much means that this reaction proceeds 100% toward products. And as an example of a non-reversible reaction, a combustion reaction where we take methane gas in the presence of oxygen and make CO2 and H2O, for the most part we could say K would, would be infinity. Because if we don't, if all the fuel burns up, we're going to have zero uh, concentration of methane. So if we have a zero in the denominator, then we know that um, that's not mathematically allowed. Dividing by zero is essentially means we have infinity as the answer. So there's not going to be a K value that looks right because the range for K can be so uh, varied. And also, as a reminder, equilibrium is only, only makes sense when we're talking about a reversible reaction. Okay. I think, uh, well, I guess we'll talk about this now. Some tricks up our sleeve with K uh, really makes sense if we look at the reaction above. So for example, if K was equal to 10 for the reaction written with ammonia in the numerator, so this would be the NH3 in the numerator, and H2 and N2 in the denominator, if we want the K value for the reverse reaction, this reverse reaction is just going to be the reciprocal of this equilibrium constant. So since I've written it in this direction, hydrogen and nitrogen will now be in the numerator, and NH3 will be in the denominator. So for a reaction written in reverse, the new K value is just the reciprocal of the original K value. So it's really just a mathematical thing. If we have K equal to 10 for this reaction as written, if we double the reaction, then the equilibrium constant is going to increase by that power. And again, it's just another mathematical uh, formula. Since K always has to be the same number, if I take NH3 squared, if I double that, um, 
then that's the same thing as squaring that concentration. So if I double my H2, it was originally cubed, then if I square that, then NH2, I mean, hydrogen cubed raised to the power of 2 is going to give me 6 hydrogens. So again, these are just little mathematical tricks. And which is kind of like the case of cross multiplying instead of just doing the algebra like you normally would. Okay. And at this point, I'm not going to worry about the, if we add some elementary steps together. I don't really care about that yet. So here's an example of just using the tricks that we just looked at. If our original reaction with two moles of sulfur trioxide decomposing to make, this should be a 4. Let me change that for you there. I did not balance that correctly. Uh, wait a minute. Oh, this is big. No, that's okay. Uh, two of these makes two of those and one oxygen. And if the equilibrium const uh, constant for that reaction was 4.0, then if I were to double the reaction, so going from here to here is doubling and reversing that reaction. So notice the two products over here become reactants, and this reactant becomes a product, and the 2 has been doubled to a 4. So we could double this or reverse it first. It doesn't really matter. But for the doubling, then my new k value is going to equal 4 raised to the second power. So that would be 16. And then now, reverse the reaction means I'm going to take the reciprocal of the equilibrium constant. So this would be 1 over 16. And then if we did that math, we would usually see that written as a fraction. Or not, not the fraction, but the decimal. Okay. So this isn't really the most important thing about chemical equilibrium, but again, it just tricks to have up our sleeve. Okay. Now, if we look at the next topic, if we have a reaction that has different states or a heterogeneous mixture. You might that, that means we have some gases and some aqueous solutions or so forth. We have to be careful when we write the equilibrium expression. So technically the only thing that shows up in the equilibrium expression are gases because those gases can undergo collisions and form products or only aqueous compounds. In other words, solids, pure solids, and pure liquids are left out of the equilibrium expression. And that's because when we write the equilibrium expression in terms of concentrations, we can't talk about a solid in a concentration term because it's not dissolved. And the same thing with a pure liquid. A pure liquid is 100% that liquid. And gases, of course, we can um, talk about in terms of pressures. So really, our pressures and our concentration units of molarity, those are the only things that uh, would show up in the equilibrium expression. So this is an example of trying to resolve calcium phosphate. And if you remember from the solubility chart, Phosphates are notoriously insoluble. And so if we talk about dissolving some calcium phosphate, that reaction is not going to go very far to the right. This will reach an equilibrium. Perhaps the very corners of this crystal lattice will be pulled away. So we will get a few ions of calcium in solution and a few ions of phosphate. This reaction will reach an equilibrium, 
And if we write the equilibrium expression, calcium, because there's three moles, is raised to the power of three. Phosphate, because there are two moles, is raised to the power of two. And again, these are concentration units. So the solid that we would normally write in the equilibrium expression is not going to be there. And we'll see this later when we talk about the solubility uh, of insoluble salts. So even though they're insoluble, to a very slight degree, they will uh, dissolve. Another example that we're going to see this equilibrium expression, this is very important for acid-base chemistry. Our pH scale is based on this. And pure water, which would be water in the liquid form, ionizes itself to a very small degree. So it's like water pulls apart some of its own uh, species. And we're left with H plus and OH minus. So there are going to be some dissolved ions in solution. And again, if we write this equilibrium expression, this is aqueous, this is aqueous, and this is a pure liquid. So this would be a heterogeneous mixture, and we leave the liquids out of the expression. So if you remember doing pH calculations, the equilibrium constant for this was a very small number. 10 to the minus 14. And again, when we write an equilibrium expression, we just need to make sure that we pay attention to the states and we leave out solids and liquids from the expression. All right, next we're going to do um, some examples where we, I'm just going to give you some. general table that we might use. Actually, I think I'll stop here and do this on another slide, just so this video doesn't get too much longer.